Good evening. Lovely to see you. Thank you for coming. Just to tell you a little bit about our other talks in the series. Um, of course, we had um, the um, Ava Zeisler celebration a couple of weeks ago. And so thrilled that Robert Wong is with us for this evening. Um, in a couple more weeks, the 15th of March, uh, we're going to have a discussion about design thinking. What is it? Is it good? Does it get in the way of design practice? What's it like? So talking to Helen Walters, maybe a couple of other people, about that, trying to clear it up in our minds. On the uh, 12th of uh, April, Annabel Seldorf is coming. She's an architect, done some lovely work, uh, particularly famous recently for the Brooklyn Recycling Center. Um, 24th of May, uh, we have um, Scott Wilson. Now, he's an industrial designer, product designer from Chicago, but he's also an entrepreneur. And he did this amazing thing with Kickstarter, where he had this idea for taking an iPod and turning it into a watch. And this became like an amazingly successful Kickstarter story. So he's going to tell us about that and some more of his work at Minimal. But also, we'll probably have some Kickstarter folks to help explain it. And then on the 14th of June, we have Walter Hood coming in from San Francisco, wonderful landscape architect. So back to tonight. Now, Robert Wong is really a man of the world. He was born Chinese. He was brought up in the Netherlands. He became an accountant in Toronto, Canada. Then he decided he wanted to be a graphic designer, so he came to New York. And he was first working as VP of Creative at Starbucks. Then he went on to be um, head of Arnold Worldwide for their creative. And then he became the creative genius who started Google Labs. So I'm sure we're very excited to have him here tonight. Robert. Thank you, Bill. It's an honor. Um, OK, so I'm going to correct a tiny little bit. It's actually Google Creative Lab. It's a small little group of uh, people here just uh, not too far away in the uh, Meatpacking District. Um, and n at one point, there was a creative Google Labs which had, uh, where they were tinkering and building a lot of the new products, or you know, I think Gmail was invented in, uh, in Labs. Um, but really, all of Google is Lab. Um, I noticed that this, the, uh, this talk was sold out, and I, and I know, and I'm humble enough to know, it has nothing to do with me. It's usually the word Google that gets everyone packed in here. And, and I'm just going to set, set the expectations right now that um, um, I have done nothing of any of the good stuff that you enjoy, all the products <laughs> from Google. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a graphic designer in training. Um, and uh, not an engineer that builds all the magical stuff. Um, and you know, you know, I went to Google to try to figure out you know, what could designers and storytellers, uh, how can they do for the brand and contribute uh, as much as engineers do through building the products. Um, OK, so I guess we move right into the, uh, the, the thing. Uh, and I'm not used to sitting down. This is kind of a. The mic is not set up, but um, uh, okay, the perfect day. I want to talk to you about, um, um, when I talk to Bill about what should we talk about, we're just, I'll be doing a lot of rambling about my life and approach and, and my work, so I hope you guys are going to be okay with that. Um, I don't know if you guys read uh, Jonathan Haidt's book, Happiness Hypothesis. If you haven't, it's a great one. I, I quoted that, like I was quoting that nonstop, but he, he, he was talking about this one thing that people's relationship with work comes in uh, three categories. Work, a job, a career, and uh, a calling. And uh, you, know, you, you do a job to, to make money so you can survive and feed your kids. Uh, you, know, you, you progress in your career so that you can feel good about yourself, the self-esteem thing, I'm doing better than the next guy. Um, and then the calling part is like where you actually get satisfaction from the work itself. Um, and the interesting thing, the most interesting thing about what he was talking about, like doesn't matter what profession you're in. So you could be a used car salesman, a plumber, a high school teacher, a physicist. It turns out the percentage of people who feel that it's a job or who feel it's a calling is about the same across all industries. Um, 
so the conclusion there is it's not the thing that we do, it's what we think about the thing that we do. So most of it's delusional in our minds. Um, and I'll tell you about my, my delusion that started uh, um, in college. I was, uh, I think, junior year watching Highlanders. I don't know if any of you guys seen that movie with Christopher Lambert. Um, but it's about uh, medieval warriors that all of a sudden popped into modern day New York. And they were disoriented. This is the first scene there in New York. And they were on a quest, uh, you know, and they had to find something. I don't even remember the plot at all. I don't even remember it was a good movie, but I remember this scene. <clears throat> and the one warrior said, how are we, you know, looking over all of Manhattan, he's like, how are we going to find the church? And the, one war the other warrior says, oh, that's easy. It's the tallest building. And they, you know, cut to the next scene. And, and I remember that it had a little bit of a, you know, a stop for a second. Of course, the tallest building is, is commerce. And, uh, and, and it had a deep impact in me. I was like, well, wait a minute. What, what is commerce doing? What is it saying? What are its doctrines? What tablets and, and uh, uh, um, things is it you know, doing to society? And at that point, my delusional purpose in life came to, okay, I'm going to become a you know, graphic designer, go into advertising or design or whatnot. And, uh, and I knew that there was like $7 trillion of marketing budgets uh, out in the world to market stuff, and you know my delusional purpose was to you know hijack as much of that money as I could to try to do good, add joy, add beauty um, and and all that stuff and that 's kind of given you know meaning um, into my work now i don 't have a clicker, so next slide i guess um, and so uh this is kind of the best thing you can get to and and uh I feel uh, 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 very fortunate that I got to, to Google um, because the founders pretty much want to solve all the world's problems. Um, and all the products are free. And uh, you know, most of them are really useful, and some of them are ab absolutely magical. And so I just get to like, try to get free stuff to people. That are, uh, so that's, that's pretty good. Um, and the interesting thing that I found is, and most of you guys I assume are designers are in the design, you know, creative uh, industry. Um, even with big companies, you realize that some, we absolutely have in our hands the most powerful tools on the planet to shape, um, you know, society and what is said. And uh, these tools are Photoshop and Final Cut Pro, uh, Illustrator, because uh, if you go to the next slide, We've designed the creative lab that all of us are only making four things. Uh, a poster, a video, a mock of what an, uh, an experience could be, or a prototype where you actually interact with something. And it's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I've been in this industry for like 20 years, and, and um, you, you realize you spend a lot of time making decks to sell ideas and all, you know, rationalize all sorts of stuff. I'm sure you guys all understand that. Um, and the more I work, the more I realize the, the most powerful thing is none of the decks is just like create the thing that, an, you know, if the product was launched tomorrow, what's the poster that's sitting in Best Buy? And what's that picture of that poster? What is that thing called? What's the line underneath it? What's the logo underneath it that makes me want it or not? And, and same thing with the video. Imagine that product is launched out in the world uh, and this is the launch video and, and you know, what the people see, what's the, what is the product? Um, and it's, it's actually been amazing because we've actually been making videos of you know, vision products and now engineers are actually building those products. And, but it's made by people who are designers and writers that have no idea about engineering or what's capable at all. But we all are human beings that like want things uh, better for ourselves. In a weird way, I feel like we're at a stage in technology where the best thing that technology can do is to get rid of the technology itself um, and just serve us in the best way possible. Um, so anyway, this is what we do. These four things, we spend as much of our time doing this as possible and nothing else. Uh, and obviously all the strategery and brand thinking and design thinking and is all baked into these four things, but uh, that's how we've sort of operated our group. Um, next slide. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the uh, um, 
you know, showing up Google is a very intimidating place. You have like some of the smartest people on the planet that have made amazing, insanely great things. And you know, the good news is that they had very little expectations of what a designer could do. <coughs> it's a good thing. <coughs> And uh, same here, we didn't really know what to do. We were like, you know, making, you know, shortcut Gmail stickers that you put on laptops and, and things like that. Because um, uh, we didn't really do marketing in the traditional sense of the word. Uh, but um, there was a problem that, that was in Google and that was uh, engineers and search, Google search, I'm sure you all use, is like our core product. And, you know, thousands of engineers are constantly innovating and iterating that product every day. You would never know it, because uh, it hasn't changed the design since 19, you know, whenever Google was started. Literally, it has not barely changed until recently. Um, and there's also <coughs> no instruction manual on the home page. Um, even though there's all these new features, like if you typed in, uh, you know, a foreign language and it knew you're, you're in a, uh, um, you know, you're coming from Google, US, it would translate whatever you typed in, or if you typed in a, a, literally a, a FedEx package number, it would give you a status without you having to go to FedEx. Or if you typed in a flight status, uh, or your flight number, it would tell you whether it's on time or not without having to you know, go through all this stuff. But no one knew about this stuff. Um, so it'd be nice for, if people knew. And the second thing that was going on is that you know, we all use Google, and it's become like the airy breathe, like utility. You know, the water that gets pumped into our faucet. And, you know, I think, frankly, most of us take it for granted. Um, and one of our missions was to try to remind the world what they love about Google. So we thought, okay, what could we do that we could remind the world what they love about Google and, and uh, also, you know, give some utility to the world to let people know that you can do all these things. So we started making these, prototyping these little videos. <clears throat> and this is this one video we, we made like two years ago now. And I don't know if you guys saw this, but uh, uh, people like this video so much internally that you know we put it online and people loved it online we said well let's uh uh put on the super bowl so google's uh first foray into marketing was a, the super bowl ad and um you can press next slide and should play um so I, I think one of the things that we we realized when i'm working on this thing is that that um uh, you know even though we obsess about making the search better and better. You know, the truth is that the best search results don't show up on a web page; they show up in people's lives. And uh, so we made this thing. It was passed around internally, and and you knew you hit gold when the engineers actually liked something that was made by people in marketing. Um, um, to the point where um, you know there was an email chain that that started uh, that like Sergey jumped in on. Because uh, we all use Gmail, that's you use Gmail. We use Docs. We like the, what you guys use at, at work. Um, like Vince Cerf, you know, inventor in the internet. He's like, "This is awesome. I love this video." Um, and then Ser Sergey weighed in and said, like, "Yeah, I, uh, you know, my wife like cried. Like I scored points, uh, total points on this one." It was just this funny thing where like a little video could actually, you know, capture the hearts of of, of Googlers who are literally like changing, you know, improving, you know our lives in, in such an amazing way. Um, um, anyway, so, so that was uh, one of the first things sort of like that, that, that sort of, you know, gave us some credibility to people who are non-engineers. Um, and uh, what's the next thing? The uh, next slide is, ah, okay. Um, uh, I don't know if you, any of you guys saw this, the uh, Les Paul Doodle. So, so what, the things that people love most about Google is, is the doodles. That's what, you know, that's, for the longest time, the only marketing, um, if you can call it marketing. Um, uh, and I don't know if you guys know the history of this, but uh, um, in the early, early days of Google, uh, they, the founders, and uh, at that time, I don't even know, the staff of like 12, want to go to Burning Man. <laughs> and so they're like, well, who's going to stay back? Like, well, nobody. Uh, <laughs> So they 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 uh, they drew a little Burning Man stick figure as kind of like the you know out of office be back in 15 minutes kind of a thing as just a little goof joke, um, and the people you know was like, "What well, you're crazy? You can't change the logos. Ah, it's okay. It's no big deal. I mean, it's not like we're going to be a big serious company or anything." Um, and uh, 
but that's that's the tradition. It just came from this like thing they they wanted to go to Burning Man, and and so uh, people love the doodles. And uh, one of the things that uh, I remember getting there was like, you know, the doodles are great, but boy, it'd be great if they uh, surprised people even more. Um, so in the last you know two years or so, we had the first animated doodle. I think the apple fell off the tree, and then a video doodle. John Lennon's birthday, you actually play a little video, um, and then the famous Pac Man doodle. Where, which wasted so many people's you know, productive hours around the world. It's, it's uh, astounding. And this is the world's first shareable doodle uh, made f uh, by a, a designer in a group um, who was just a mad musician guitarist. And this is for Les Paul's birthday. And he actually uh, uh, recorded the sound in this uh, from his Les Paul. Um, if you can just play this little video. Uh, the, the coolest thing was we launched this thing and then within six hours someone had built a website to, you know give it was like a song sheet for people to like okay if you want to play this song it's like EGFFF -F -F. and it was like instantly people just took it and this is the, one of the coolest things that like we have we're lucky to have one of those brands that people don't think about it as a separate thing people see like homepages as, as as their thing um, uh, and that's one of the things we try to do is like we try to you know, we make the plumbing and other people are the stars and they, they actually, you know, you're always amazed. You can never write or create something better than like what, you know, six billion people on the planet when they take your stuff, you know, what they do with it. Um, okay, what's the next thing is, that? okay, speaking of that, so, so uh, you know, we <coughs> after the search on um, <coughs> series, we made like 12 of those videos. Uh, we're like, okay, there's enough talking about the features. Let's talk about like, we make awesome stuff, but it is what other people do with it that's even more awesome. So we literally use Google to find interesting stories of how people use Google. So here's, here's one. It's pretty amazing. Like, I don't often watch these things, so I'm watching it along with you guys here. Uh, and, and you realize this, like, uh, information is oxygen. And, and we probably live in a time like no other time ever in the history of humanity where we have so much access to so much information that we could pull off and do so many amazing things. Um, anyway, I'm just in the moment with you right now. Um, the, uh, the, the next thing is, uh, what's the, what is the next thing? Ah, okay. Um, um, you know, having gotten, having Google and YouTube, get, you know, get into its role in society, you realize that, you know, we can create pretty big stages for people. And uh, you know, how do you use technology to do things that a single person could not do themselves? And uh, uh, most people can't go off and make a feature film, but you know, with YouTube, we thought, okay, we, what if we told the world to, to, literally the world, this was actually launched in every country, uh, to upload whatever video they want on that single day, and then we'll have Rid Ridley Scott, uh, who produced this thing, you know, Try to make a movie out of this thing. So this was uh, back to the back to the uh, uh, make a poster, make a comp, make a video thing. This was the video that was made to pitch the idea internally to get marketing support and resources to do. So someone just like used you know Final Cut Pro and made this little thing. Now I'm, I'm going to get the stats wrong, but I think uh, um, there were submissions from 140 countries and I think 80,000 hours of video. Um, and I think the final film that was cut um, had uh, credits of uh, uh, I think 1,800 people. Um, and and actually the project like we thought oh that's a cool idea and then you, with these things that we, like we've never things you've never done before you never know what you're going to get to and you realize when all the film came in like. 
there was no human possible way for the traditional editing process to work. Like, an, you can't hire enough editors to look at all the film to pick out. So, so they actually tagged everything uh, with a computer program, uh, you know, like, oh, Tiger, Sunset. Um, and so that we, they could only, you know, review a portion of the, the film. And then when they said, like, okay, yeah, a nice Tiger shot would be nice right now. And pff, it would pull up the right. Th so it, it was, uh, uh, we were just making this up on the fly. Uh, and the film is done and it was premiered um, in Sundance uh, to some critical acclaim. Discovery picked it up. Um, and uh, it was running in theaters for a while. Um, and now you can all watch it on YouTube for free. So you have to check it out. It's actually, I was always like horrified thinking, oh, this thing could be like really boring. And, and uh, I was actually surprised. The second act is always tough, but the beginning and the end is actually, it's well worth checking out. Um, what's, what's the next thing? Ah, Wilderness Downtown. Um, so uh, how many of you guys know what a browser is? Okay. Uh, it's not, that's not bad. Um, when we started uh, working on Chrome, which is Google's browser, we realized no one knew or cared what a browser was. Um, but the interesting thing is, you know, I think in U.S., more people, uh, people spend more time in a browser than they do in their cars. Everyone knows what car they drive, what car they want, but no one knows what browser they have. Some people say, like, my browser is Google, or my browser is, like, AT&T. Um, um, and, of course, uh, for Google, all our products are experienced through a browser. So we have an interest for a browser to be really good, so our products get better. And, um, and that's why we built a browser. Um, and we also believe that the better browsers get, the better anyone out in the world making a website, those, you know, the websites get, the world gets better. We just better, you know, if we had a fundamental belief of you know why this is, why this is good. Now, uh, in the early days uh, when we first launched Chrome and no one cared what a browser was, we we were like, okay, why don't we just try to push the limits of, uh, build something that pushes the limits of what a browser can do, so that pretty much uh, if you really want to experience this thing, you have to have it on the most you know insanely awesome mo modern browser. Otherwise, it will just like break. Uh, so we 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 created this film with uh, Chris Milk um, and Arcade Fire. Uh, it was their sort of the first interactive music video thing experienced through a browser. You type in your address of where you grew up, and you have this experience where the Street View images and the, and the Google Earth images of your home address you know, gets played into uh, the video that you watch. This is just a little snippet. Try this at home. Type in a, you know, your address and, and, and hear the whole song, because this little thing doesn't really do it justice. You know, it's interesting, like, we're, we're pretty proud of this piece, um, and it won all sorts of crazy awards and stuff, but back to my job career, or Jonathan Haidt's job career and calling thing, you know, yes, he got a lot of people to download Chrome to experience this thing, and yes, it won a lot of awards, but the most satisfying thing is that, you know, we know that we did this so that more people could benefit from a modern browser, and that's the thing that, like, feels... The, the best, like, okay, you know, progress. And actually, you know, after Chrome launched and after it started to rise up, and now it's like, I think, number two, um, IE and got like a trillion times better. Like, uh, um, uh, they, they had a monopoly, you know, in browsers, so they just stagnated the innovation on it. And so uh, Firefox tried to make a dent, and it did, you know, a certain degree, but then now, we, you know, we helped, we're heating up the competition, and now, like, all browsers are getting better, which we all benefit from, which is totally awesome. Um, the next thing is um, um, something less sort of edgy and more e every day uh, um, um, to get the average person to really um, not understand what a browser is, but just realize that with the web, you, there's awesome stuff that you can do. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but uh, we made, uh, w when I first started at Google, I heard the story, I have a, two girls, a six and seven year old, an engineer, heard about an engineer that uh, was using email to write you know, letters uh, to uh, you know, set up an account for his daughter, was writing emails to her daughter before she was born, and then all up to it, you know, while she's growing up, and, you know, he hopes to share it with her someday. Um, and so I was blown away by that, like just that little simple hack of, you know, Gmail's been around forever, and, you know, he thought of this cool use of it. So we made a video about this. All right. Um, 
I love that little story. Anyway, uh, the next thing is one of the, within this Chrome thing, is one of the uh, things I'm most proud of recently. Um, play next. So I don't know if you guys heard of Dan Savage, but the It Gets Better uh, movement. Um, so a, a group of gaglers, that's what inside Google they call themselves gaglers, um, you know, they, they were inspired by Dan Savage's video, so they made their own video, and it was all these Google employees, you know, saying, like, it gets better, it's awesome, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was this long video, uh, and I saw it, and I was so moved as, like, we should run this stuff as ads, like, in YouTube, where, you know, if anyone searches for anything related to suicide, you know, let's have that ad there. And, and then uh, after this thing ran um, a little bit, we got this email. Uh, I don't know if you guys can can read this out, but I'll read it to you. I'll try to read it from here. Dear Google, a few days ago, I was trying to find a way to kill myself on YouTube. In the sidebar was your company's It Gets Better video. I don't know why, but I watched it. I watched it many times, actually. I had been so depressed after going to, to many job interviews and being blatantly told no because I'm gay. I just felt like I couldn't do it anymore. I had uh, the rope tied to a beam in my house and was trying to figure out how to tie a noose. Uh, I can't believe that I was so intent on doing this. Watching your video made me realize that there are companies out there um, who will accept me for who I am. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart that you did save a life, mine. I am so thankful. And, you know, this thing passed around, and we were so moved. Uh, you know, communication you know, it can be artful, useful information. And... Um, and we said, well, let's make a story about Dan Savage. Um, and let's, uh, so we talked to Dan. It was, it was actually really interesting. So we made this, this uh, next video. Why don't you play it real quick? I mean, it, it's just true. It's documentary. And uh, um, uh, the interesting thing was um, when we talked to Dan, you know, and this thing launched uh, on, on, the, on Glee, I think the premiere of Glee, um, or the first episode of the season of Glee. Um, but he was like, well, that's, you know, preaching to the converted, you know, you need to run it on, like, Monday Night Football, you know, like, uh, and we're like, you know what, you're totally right. So, so it's, it's interesting because, like, I don't know if you guys have ever done media plans, and so like, it's like, you know, how do you optimize for reach and frequency and blah, blah, blah. But we were just like, okay, where should this thing run to have the impact that we want to have to the most amount of people, the right people, people who have never, you know, uh, has been hiding it. And, uh, and of course, uh, what's great about the web is when you put stuff out there, you always see the comments. And, and, and there was a great, one of my favorite comments uh, in YouTube was uh, uh, the this, this son who was writing in. It was like, it was really cool. We, you know, I was watching TV with my dad, and this commercial came on, and he put his arm around me and said, son, you know, whatever you are, whatever you do, it's okay with me because I love you. He says, I'm not gay, but I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, you know, it, this stuff matters. It's, uh, you know, you can either add beauty, or add joy, or, or, you know. And sorry, I, I played a lot of videos. I just, you know, we also design. Uh, we, we've uh, redesigned products and stuff, but like showing web pages is kind of boring. Just thought it just show stuff that moved with sound and music. Um, what's what's the next thing? Is there anything else? Ah, this concludes today's conversation. Uh, no, I I, I do want to just you know uh, summarize a little bit um, that I don't know if you guys read the right uh, what is it the whole new mind? Uh, that's another great one. You know the right. The right brain rising, you know, uh, this is the era where the creative class uh, synthesizes all sorts of stuff, and we can really, really lead. Um, you know, my version of leading is making those four things. Uh, you know, everyone can find their own version of leading, um, and we really can change the world um, and invent the future. Because, um, you know, engineers are great at solving problems. Sometimes, you know, they need a little help figuring out, like, what the problem is that needs to be solved um, or come at it from, you know, exactly the user's, you know, perspective. Anyway, so um, um, there's a, there's a, it reminds me of a, of, a, of a story of the first grader who was drawing this crazy portrait. Um, I heard this from Paul Hawkins. Uh, and, you know, 
her teacher was like, wait, what are you drawing there? And she's like, oh, that's a picture of God. And she says, oh, no one knows what God looks like. And she says, well, they will when I'm done. Uh, <laughs> uh, duh. Uh, and anyway, uh, all I can say to anyone here who knows Photoshop or Final Cut Pro or, or can code a little bit is that, uh, you know, we don't know what the world's gonna look like, but I feel like we have a lot of awesome resources at our disposal that we're sitting on now that's different than any other time in the history. Um, and, you know, better world, maybe, you know, uh, uh, they might know when we're done. Anyway, that's, that's, that's the end. I think it was one last slide. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, that's that, my delusional half an hour. Lovely. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I want to talk a bit about design. Of course, what you showed us was design, but it was very narrative. It was closer, perhaps, to advertising than the way we think of design normally. Um, perhaps I could ask you to talk about that, but let me frame it by a little story of my own. I think it's just about 10 years um, since I interviewed um, the Google founders um, for my book called uh, Designing Interactions. And I've only been at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum for a couple of years, so before that I was at IDEO in San Francisco, and it was easy to meet these people. And so, um, you know, I invited them to, um, to come to the studio we had at IDEO in Palo Alto for a video interview, and um, um, Larry Page actually turned up on time wearing a jacket. He looked pretty normal. Um, but <coughs> Sergey turned up 20 minutes late, wearing a very crumpled Google T-shirt on his rollerblades. <laughs> so I had this lovely video of them, you know, like sort of sitting next to each other, being videoed with the crumpled T-shirt and the jacket man, which was good. But anyway, talking about design, you know, Google is such an engineering-driven community, and they think of themselves, I think, as engineers. So um, when it came to, I asked about the design of the website, and remember when it started 10 years ago, I mean, all the other websites were these horrible banner ads and flashing things, and you couldn't see the screen for everything going on and going on and going on. And there was this beautiful, simple white Google with one search box, and that was it. What a breakthrough. Um, so, but I asked, you know, Sergey, so what happened? How did you come up with that? And he said, oh, I didn't really design it. I just threw it together overnight, you know. It's just, I just, all I wanted to do was have something that was simple. And this was such a kind of non, it was almost an anti-design statement in a way, because although it was a brilliant design that really was innovative to the degree that it put everything else on the world at the time behind it, at the same time he kind of didn't admit that it was designed. So what do you think uh, about the design of the original website and, and that kind of attitude? I, I I think words sometimes have different meanings to different people. So like, you know, to them design might have been a dirty word in their minds uh, that although in, in anyone who's trained as a design thinker, you realize that they were designing the whole time. As engineers, they're designers, obviously. Um, I think it's brilliant. I, I remember at one point counting how many l clickable links there were on uh, Excite uh, years before I started working at Google. Um, obviously, when that existed, and it was like over 300, and then there was a you know Alta Vista over you know 280, and then Google had like seven clickable links, and and uh, the 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 awesome thing about that, why I think it's actually to me the touchstone of all our brand stuff. I always like if one, anyone asks like, you know what's what's Googly like? How do I know if I'm doing something right or not? I go well, look at the home page. Does it does it does it have the same principles as the home page? Which when you think about it, to your point, it's just a square with a blinking cursor asking the user, what do you want? What are you looking for? There's nothing about you know, Google except for the, the logo. Um, it, and there's nothing as like, doesn't try, try to sell you anything, it doesn't, you know. Um, um, so I think, you know, design is a set of principles and beliefs that you hold and, uh, and they actually have held fast. Now, we've recently redesigned uh, or tweaked on surface, um, uh, you know, most of the products, uh, you know, whether it's YouTube or Gmail or 
him and Google homepage. But it's, it's really just surface. The, the, the underlying principles is, is the most important thing. And, our, and our, you, know, you know, we have this saying internally, like, you know, just assume people are smart and respect their time. You know, if you're not giving them anything, you know, you're, you're wasting their time. Um, so you just try to get out of the way. And, you know, the first search on the Parisian love thing, it's just like we got out of the way of, of just the product and the user. And so how can you say, like, respect their time when you just told us that you wasted 5.4 million hours of people's productive time? <laughs> they chose. They chose that. <laughs> they opted in. <laughs> and... Uh, but, but I think that sense of fun of the Les Paul Doodle is also part of the Google brand DNA, like the, uh, uh, you know, just like the, the, uh, uh, the Burning Man thing. Actually, our favorite holiday is April Fool's. I don't know if you guys participate in the April Fool's thing. Like, that's where, like, oh, let's do something, you know, because, uh, you know, they're, they're PhD students, you know, that, that are men, you know, live in dorms. They, they like pranking. Um, and there's, there's always a little bit of that cheeky, you know, wink in everything that like, yes, we might be solving the, all the world's problems, but let's have fun doing it. Um, uh, one of the things I always say is like, you know, w when people ask you know, a new designer, like, okay, what is the most googly thing next to the logo? I always say like, it's the name. And, and I don't know if you guys know the, the history of the name Google, but uh, uh, it was invented here. Uh, right across the Hudson, the Palisades, a, a mathematician in the 30s uh, from Columbia. He was walking, um, taking a stroll with his nephews uh, one day, a nine-year-old and 13-year-old, and they were talking about math stuff, as you do with your uncle, who's a mathematician. And they were like, what's the biggest number in the, in the universe? In this, and he was like, oh, I don't know, 10 to the power of 100. That's one with 100 zeros behind it. It's like, and just so you know how big that is, um, there's not a there's not that many stars, planets, grains of sand, particles in the known universe. That's how big a Google is. Um, hard to wrap your head around that. And the kids are like, well, what is it? does it have a name? And they're like, no, why don't you invent it? And so the nine-year-old was like, you know, could have been Yala Davidu. He was like, Google. Like, and they just started, uh, and then the math person just started putting it in white papers. It's like, you know, Google. So, so uh, it's literally like nine-tenths awesome infinite science and one tenth baby talk pretty much um, <laughs> um, and i and i think it's actually a good you know little balance to play with and when sergey comes to town um, do you talk to each other about design issues or yeah but the, the design issues uh are more problems issues i i you know it depends how you def define design does you talk about like white space and and like, you know, the hairline rules on, no. Um, um, but um, Larry, in particular, in the last two years has been, uh, you know, really into the word beauty. He's like, he realized he wants one beautiful, seamless experience across all Google products. So he, that, design is definitely on his mind. Uh, but but Sergey, Sergey, uh, I think the first conversation he had with us uh, when he first met, you know, me and Andy, um, he was talking about, um, you know, uh, I think Andy asked him, like, what's been, what's on your mind lately? And he was, Boxes. And, and this is the first time Andy met him, so he was kind of like, okay, okay, uh, I'm going to fire right now. I don't know what he's talking about. Boxes is some, like, molecular scientific thing. I should, like, he's like, mm, boxes. <laughs> he's like, cardboard boxes. It's like, oh, yeah, of course, cardboard boxes. And, and what he meant by that, it was like, I've been thinking about how stupid carpet boxes are. You know, they, and Fresh Direct, I'm sure you guys all use it. I mean, they're made, they have one use, they're thrown out, and this goes on like a billion times a second around the world. Um, and it was like, yeah, I don't know. I just, that was the last thing I've been thinking about is like boxes, like I wish could, we could fix them. Uh, it's a problem. So when does he think, do we think about, does he think about design? Yes, like designing the world. You know, what sucks and what needs to be de-suckified. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. And I think good designers think that, right? Like, I mean, signage systems, what is that? Like, you know, uh, Renee knows, like, I get so pissed off if 
a sign is in the wrong place because you know you created doubt in my mind, anxiety for a split second as I'm driving, and and you know that's deciding the world. You know, I, anyway. Tell us about the little robot, the android. Ah, yes, we created that logo. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you want to know about it? How did you do it? Uh, it was, uh, I think, the, literally the first uh, week that Andy got there, and um, it was like, we're, we're launching Android. It's like, okay, we need a logo. And uh, and I actually really love the speed at Google. It's like, there's one gear, and it's like hyper fast. Um, and okay, uh, you know, normally it would take you know months to develop. Maybe we have to like interview sh st you know stakeholders of shareholders, and you know maybe do a global research before we do the logo. Um, but we, we realized that this little operating system was potentially going to be um, well is open, so that any carrier, anyone can use. So we realized that we, we want to create an uh, uh, an open logo. So there's no fixed logo. I mean, except for the dimensions and the color of this little guy, um, anyone can do anything they want with it. Uh, so Sprint ads made them 3D and flying around. Uh, the only thing we said is like, make sure it's tiny because, you know, we, we are not afraid of tiny little things. We kind of, um, and we, we just drew it to have a little bit of a friendly, you know, because Android, you can imagine how scary it could also be technology. And most of the time we try to counter that with, okay, let's just make sure it's like cute and friendly. Talking of uh, deep thinking there, cute and friendly. Research and design. Um, another person that I interviewed was Terry Winograd, who's a professor at Stanford, who um, taught uh, the Google boys before they, well, as they were starting the company, really. And he told me a story because after they'd left and started Google, um, he did a sabbatical where he was at Google for a year. And he said that, you know, he'd been given, it's the Gates building which he runs, and he'd been given a lot of um, foundation money to put uh, complicated new technology for communication in the basement. And then he was inviting people to come in and use it. And it was a tedious and complicated process, you know, so you had to invite them in, they had to come in, and then you did this user test, you watched them and you interviewed them, and you tried to find out what it was like for them, and you tried to learn from that and do your next iteration of the design. And he said the amazing difference was that when he went to Google, they put up a prototype, and within 24 hours they had millions of responses. So that whole loop of speed in terms of getting response about whether people like things or are annoyed by them, but there is this thing about Google always putting things up with a couple of breaks in it or problems or the beta things never quite work, isn't there? I mean, a sort of, is that a philosophy of let's put it up when it doesn't quite work? No, it, it's a launch and iterate factor. Uh, fast is better than s slow. There's certain things that, like, let's get it out there. There's, it, it's almost a, um, um, I think there's a little philosophy of, like, coming from a humble place that we can't figure this out. Um, I, I recently, uh, uh, it, it, uh, Ted Global in Edinburgh had this, uh, I forget his name, the man talk about, you know, um, the need for, you know, trial and error as the fundamental operating system that we have to adopt in this new age when problems are so complex. You can't think your way through them. Um, and uh, uh, he, he, great, he, he told this great story about a, a little nozzle um, that's made, that's, that's engineered for producing detergent, you know, transforming like liquid into like powder. So the, you know, if you, as, if all the liquid turns into perfectly usable detergent powder, then, you know, more profit for, you know, the detergent company. Um, and, but it's very fickle how the liquid turns into things. So th these nozzles are like little chess pieces. And uh, any given new location, new factory, the air, the water, the, all, everything makes a huge difference. And so they have these experts, the world experts in nozzle design. Um, um, you didn't think there was a thing, but there is a thing. And, and you know, the design is thing, and you realize, like, okay, that didn't do so well. Then they did 10 variations of that and did a test, and then the best of those 10, they did 10 variations of that until 47 generations later, they got the nozzle that like turned 
almost all the liquid into the perfect detergent. And at the end of the day, and that, that same engineer and the expert can look at that thing and have no idea why that one and not the one in the 46th generation. And so while trial and error seems to be like, well, duh, of course, that seems like, of course, that's just what you should do. Uh, but the problem is if you look at education today and even how we elect officials, there's no trial and error. That's not the fundamental operating system. The system is there's an authoritative figure with the right answers or the wrong answers, and you get six out of the ten right answers, you're, you're mediocre. If you get ten out of ten, you're smart. If you're three, you're dumb. And then politicians, they win on ideas that they express before the thing. They have no idea if it's going to work or not, but their, their success is driven by whether they are able to carry through their idea. And so until the day a politician can stand up and say, you know, hey, these are the three problems I'm going to focus on, nothing else. I have no idea how I'm going to do it, and people vote for them, and then that person goes out and tests a thousand ways to like, solve the financial crisis, not knowing which one's going to work, and iterate until they get an answer, you know, and we are patient enough. With, like, that society doesn't exist. Um, so it, it, weirdly enough, yeah, on the online real testing world, we have a little bit of that luxury to do that. So I, I think, yeah, it is a... And now, it, it's not... All or nothing. It's. It's. Uh, I'm personally. I don't necessarily think like that's the only way, but it's one way. You know, the other way sometimes is you know the, the launch and iterate can o only do so much around the iterating original thing. Sometimes you know a designer or an engineer has to just imagine something that no one could even imagine, and create that as whole as it can. Um, you know, and then do the launch and iterate. So I think you need you need both. Well, in terms of prototyping, though, I mean, I'd like to ask you about your own methods of prototyping, because what you showed us was very much narrative. It was stories, and I imagine you used lots of sub-prototyping methods, but the main prototyping idea for the ad seemed to be storytelling. And, you know, if you think about your nozzle example, you'd think of those prototypes as being made in a shop, which yeah. is really the tradition of three-dimensional design. And then you think of, like, interactive design, you think of people making prototypes either with little hardware kits or yep. perhaps on screen with a program. And then you think of you know, architectural prototyping where you make a model of something that's small and then you try and make a bit of the environmental experience. And then when it gets complicated with things like services, you put all those together and then maybe that narrative thing comes in. But, but tell us more about how you actually think of you and your team putting prototypes together. So, so I definitely showed you all the, mostly the video prototypes because they play well. Uh, um, but we do... Uh, if you walk down the, uh, you did walk down our little hall, you saw that like all we have up are printouts of, you know, interface prototypes um, um, and even the Android thing. I don't know if you guys ever played with Androidify. It's a, it's a little app you can download and you can make a little, your own personal Android. So like, you know, if you like to wear plaid, red plaid shirts and white running shoes, you can make a little Android that's, you know, short and uh, have medium skin. Um, and And that was a prototype. Like we just, hacked it and coded it like oh is this cool is this magical because at the end of the day what prototypes uh, at least for us creatives is like it's fun to make and it's also it's easy to react to you know like does you feel it like does that have heart does it have magic and then you go ooh, that warrants more investment more time more team energy so um we you know i know you saw a lot of film prototypes but we prototype you know um you know we code stuff we do lots of posters, um, you know, half the time you feel like if an idea can't be, you know, um, put down to a poster, it's probably not a clear enough idea. And actually, most of the time when people have an idea, I go, okay, make a poster out of that. So, so the, uh, the life in the day, the first thing that was made was, uh, uh, was a poster and then the, f then the film pretending to like, okay, if it was a call to action to participate, what it would be. So uh, it, it's, it's always, for us, we're always prototyping the end result you know, pretend if... The uh, experience and, of the people. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because what you realize is, um, 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 you know, I don't know if you guys read the Steve Jobs book, um, but you realize that, like, in all the time, as a, as a CEO, all the time that he could be spending on, on uh, the company, you know, the infrastructure of the technology, you know, the strategic planning the, uh, uh, you know, business operation processes, you know, human capital and how to optimize it, you know, to like at the top, like, you know, the, the, the packaging and communication 
of the products to the actual products themselves. On the left, at the tip of the pyramid, is like industrial design, what people touch. On the right is you know, interaction design, what people you know, see. And you realize, reading this book, and I've known people you know, working at, within Apple, that he spends 90% of his time on the tiny tip of the triangle. And why? Because that's what the world sees. That's what the world touches. That's what the world hears. Um, it's design. It's design. It's design. With everything baked in, you know? And I think often, uh, you know, whether it's advertising or design, it easily can be taken to mean the layer you put on top of something, you know? It's not the icing on the cake. It is the butter or the flour, you know? Uh, it has to be baked into the whole thing. Um, one more question, then I want to open it up for the audience. I'm sure they have lots of things they'd like to ask you about. Um, but let's go back to where I started, which is you being a man of the world, and tell us a little bit about um, how, what you think those different experiences in different cultures have meant for you. Yeah, I've done the psychoanalysis myself a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. I feel really fortunate because, and I can't imagine, I have two kids and I wish I could create that uh, variety of experiences. Like when I grew up in, when I was born in Hong Kong, I wasn't born in Hong Kong, that Hong Kong you visit. I was born in new territories on the border of China in a village that has no running water. So I, I was born in a place of dirt floors and like, you know, we didn't have shoes. Like it was very third world. Um, um, and from there, you know, uh, my, my grandfather, you know, went to Holland to open up a Chinese restaurant because that's what, people who look for new opportunities who are Chinese, that's what they do, they open Chinese restaurants. Um, <laughs> and and uh, uh, I'm allowed to say that, because I'm Chinese. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but, the th but the, literally, it, it was, uh, you know, and my, my parents followed the, his footsteps, and it was literally, you get on a, on a bus or a train, you get off at a stop, and you look out, and you go, is there any Chinese restaurant in this town? No, okay, I'm, I get off. And, and so I grew up in small, uh, a fishing village in, in Holland where we were the only Chinese restaurant um, and it was my first sort of Western experience and then at one point my parents, uh, you know, the restaurant was successful and, and they, uh, you know, they were very impulsive or my dad is anyway and they flew to Canada in 1976. This is when Canada was voted the world's number one city. CN Tower was being built. Uh, the Canadian dollar was 20% uh, above the US dollar. The future was resting. The immigration policies were really lax. Um, they're like, let's move here. The kids should learn English. Um, and so, you know, I grew up in the suburbs of Toronto, Wayne's World, where Mike Myers, I went to his high school. I mean, and, and then, you know, when I decide to uh, go to college, when I realized accounting wasn't my thing, you know, decided to go to New York City, the most dense, most urban, international place on the planet. So I've had this amazingly rich life experience um, that I'm sure did something. I don't know if it's good or bad, but... Um, I think um, it shows. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing for sure that it does is it... it uh, I, I read an article in the New York Times about people have kids who are brought up in... Uh, uh, bilingual have more empathy because they constantly have to figure out their context. And empathy is all about context. You know, like in this situation, I do this. In this situation, I do that. If, with this person, I do this. With that, yeah. And so, uh, so I thought that was very interesting. Uh, and then the second thing is I also realized that there was no right answer. Meaning, um, you know, you grow up and um, I don't think, like, things that I thought were visceral and like not changeable, like the people's reaction to pain. You know, like if you get hit in Hong Kong, you say, ayah, and you get hit, you know, you get pinched in Spanish, you say something else. And I, I realized I was growing up, I was like, wait a minute, how come everyone's like reacting to pain with a different thing? And you realize there's no correct answer. Um, and so I think that, you know, when you realize there's no correct answer, you're more open to things. And, uh, uh, and when you start with a little bit of like constantly thinking about your context, you might have a little bit more empathy. And I, honestly, I do think empathy is probably the number one ingredient for any designer, you know, uh, which is opposite of an artist, um, you know, which is expressing something. And I think, um, um, you know, I, I love art. I just feel like, you know, I've chosen design as my 
my my career and I and I think that just constantly think about what other people are thinking and doing and how to you know best um, make things better for them is is cool great so there's a microphone here on a stand and uh, if you'd like to come up and stand you know to make there's another one over here so particularly for our online streaming audience um, please say who you are um, when uh, as before you say anything else you'd like to say um, so come on up in the meantime, we can talk about, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> Here's somebody. Right. Hi there. My name is Amanda Gelb. I'm an educator and a curator. Um, and based on what you said and just design in general, I think design can apply to anyone, um, but people don't necessarily know what it is or how to use it in their lives. So how would you answer those questions? Uh, what, what is design and how can it apply to anyone? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I, maybe I've given up on trying to define it because I think you're designing every day, every second of the, when you, when, you figure, when you try to decide what shoes to wear, you're designing some part of your self-image. And so it's, it's, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, reading and writing and, and stuff versus a separate thing. So um, I don't know. I, I, I'm obviously a huge fan of design thinking, so the more design thinking is baked into everything is where I feel like uh, it's kind of all about, and even less so. I'm actually not less interested in design as its own, you know, ivory tower to earn its table, you know, amongst commerce or whatever. I'm much more interested in the horizontalness of design um, across everything, and I think that would be a useful thing to to get into the minds of young people and educators. One over here. Um, I'm here with actually a design team. Um, we work at an e-commerce site across the street. I think our biggest challenge is communicating to the rest of our e-commerce site um, that design is, it's a little different than Google, but it seems like Google puts um, usability first and then maybe like design second, or I'm curious how it works with the company and how um, your position kind of comes into play when it was added a little later, perhaps, in the development of Google. Um, really, I'm asking in terms of kind of to get something out of it with like how we could communicate to our company. That's important. Well, it, it, yeah, it's a great question because I think everyone struggles with that. Uh, we're lucky that we got the seat at the table with like, you know, we have Larry, Larry and Sergey's ear. I don't know how we got it. Uh, uh, we stumbled into it. Um, um, so I don't en en envy anyone who has to fight their way to that. My, my only thing is you can never argue your way. You can never PowerPoint your way or prove because the, it, I just found that this doesn't work. And the only thing you can do is show them something shiny that they want to make. Which gets back to my four things, the, the poster or the mock of like, like, hey, isn't this cool? Do you want it? You know, that, uh, that's how we've done it. It's either like, well, you could have this or you could have this. It looks like this now. It could look like this. And, and uh, you know, and that. You're proactive, basically, is what you're saying. You're like one step ahead. Well, it's not even the one step, because I'm sure you're proactive trying to change in people's minds. It's just the vehicle, which is this, you know, show what the user will see, and that them, and they bring it home, they, they show it to the wives, because ultimately the wives decide. You go like, hey, which one do you think our old way is? And the wives go, oh, that's much better. Like, oh, okay, cool. Um, so, I, yeah, I think, I think you, you should use the shiny thing. You shoot the poster, you use the mock, you use the, you know. So, what's, by the way, what's the difference between a mock and a prototype? Uh, prototype actually works, so I can interact with it. So it's coded. Does that make sense? So like, uh, um, uh, it's an actual interaction thing. You can play on a computer or play on an interface. And a mock, and a mock is just a still picture. Or just no, a it's just a, it's a flat picture. It's probably closer to a poster. A post, poster, yeah. Well, poster uh, has more leeway. A mock usually is uh, for our products, and a poster is an idea for anything. So um, that's not necessarily like an interface design or anything. It's, that's just like 
you know, hey, how about YouTube Symphony Orchestra or Google, you know, Google Play? We put the Guggenheim logo next to the YouTube logo, and and you just imagine like, oh, that'd be cool to to do something with the Guggenheim. And it, that's that's how we. It's totally cheating, but it's great. Hi, um, my name is Joseph Lara. I'm a design student at City College. Um, this is referencing back to what you mentioned about um, art and design. Uh, someone once told me that um, fine arts uh, tends to ask questions and designs answer them. And I wanted to know, get your personal feedback as to you, how do you feel about um, design and in contrast with um, fine arts. That's a good question. I, uh, I think there's definitely a lot of merit to that. You know, um, um, I, I think that's probably pretty good. <laughs> I, uh, you know, um, the the one thing, the only thing I would say is, um, designers actually I found, and this is the thing that I work try to work on the most is like we love problems, you know, and the juicier the problem, the more we attack it with ferocity, and the and the clearer and the crisper the problem is presented to you, the more focused you are, your creative energy in solving that thing, uh, which which I think is great. However. You know, there's a ceiling to that because then you're always relying on someone presenting you with the problem. And uh, I think in the last uh, um, you know, five years of my career, I, I think I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the problems are themselves uh, and, and invent the future without anyone even asking for it, um, which is still not the same as asking, you know, provocation, as I would say, you know, asking a question, because the, 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 the goal is still to answer it at the end of the day. Um, that's what designers do. Well, you can, I mean, actually, a little pitch again for the Helen Walters conversation on the 15th of March. Um, design thinking, you can think of as being trying to decide what to do, whereas design practice is more about how you do it. And I think a lot of people have both. I mean, they, they have some element of deciding what to do, and then they go on and do the, the design of it. Um, but we'll come back to that then. Uh, we have another question here. Hi, my name is Chloe Gingrich. I'm a student at FIT, and I kind of wanted to thank you. Um, I found my biological mother through Google. Um, wow. I was adopted from Paraguay, so I kind of relate to your story a little bit about third world country. Um, and I was wondering, do you ever um, feel like you're changing lives, like on a day-to-day -day basis, just like I was connected, you know, to a third world country, to, yeah. you know, a completely different world just last year, and all thanks to you. Well, it's moments like this that make <laughs> it all not suck. Uh, uh, no, it's, it, listen, I mean, most of the time, like everyone else, you know, in the day-to-day -day grind of things, you're caught up on, oh, no, I'm late for my meeting again, or, or oh, no, this deadline, uh, like everyone else. But I think the moments that you can stop and reflect and, you know, hear a story, uh, yeah, um, you know, very moved. And, and, uh, um, and you do realize, you know, well, I realize how fortunate I am, how lucky I am, how, te how lucky the team is that gets to work, you know, on something that, you know, oftentimes I do feel like, um, even though it's a company, you know, no one actually sets out to make companies, actually. You know, it's individuals, the founder, and the good thing is the founders still run the company. Uh, there's founder ideals, and it's human beings. There's engineers that have their dreams and wishes and intent and, and desires, desires, and like when they die, what, are they, what's, what, what do they feel like they've done? Um, and I think, you know, on our best days, that's in the back of our minds is, you know, we've given this opportunity this time, with these resources, Google our back, the internet, you know, what did we accomplish? And uh, um, I try to keep it as much in the foreground as possible and present that to the team because it's very easy for most people to like, to everyone to just go dive into the day-to-day minutia. Uh, but, uh, but your stories like yours help a lot. Thank you so much for sharing. One more. Uh, hi, my name is Max Kaplan. I'm a graphic designer. Uh, I just wanted to ask, a lot of the videos you showed are very cinematic, and I was just wondering what the, st what the, uh, the structure of the Creative Lab was. Do you have, is it all designers, filmmakers? Good, good question. We actually, um, we, uh, it's, we launched and iterated. Um, 
at first we had a model of what I thought it was. It was like, okay, there's a couple of principles we had. Uh, first was, if I had a credit card and I had to pay for everything myself, who would I hire to start my company? You know, and just a forcing mechanism um, um, of scarcity of resources. Uh, and actually, uh, Google offers it, it that way. It, there's like a, you know, bipolar thing of like scarcity and abundance, like, you know, little time, no, no, no money, no engineers, you know, what can you make? When they hit big, like, okay, now let's put infinite resources behind it. Uh, but back to your thing. So that's how we started. We thought, okay, I'll have, I'll, I'll do four pods of creatives. Um, um, so there are only mini startups, you know, of like three people or four people in a team. Once we do one thing, we make a couple of cool things and people want more of those, we'll get another team and we kind of grew horizontally. And then one of the things that uh, we realized that we need to prototype more. We needed a filmmaker and an animator. Uh, and I started this program a, y uh, a year in called The Five, and we recruited uh, five of the top students around the world uh, from the disciplines of graphic design, uh, advertising, so writing and art direction, uh, creative coding, uh, filmmaking, um, and we had a wild card, like whoever thinks that they want to geek out at Google. Um, <laughs> and it was awesome because we had these kids right out of school and, um, um, you know, and they could make everything. Like, you know, we were old farts that only had ideas. And they actually could make, they could prototype stuff. They're like, look what I made, you know? It's like, <laughs> whoa, that's really cool. Uh, the, the Parisian love thing, that was made, they made that video, uh, they had that, you know, we were talking about that, yeah, that you know, that night, that morning, they cobbled together this rough thing that was pretty much Parisian love, uh, and we played it in the meeting, and everyone, you know, ooh, this pro something promising to that. Um, so it's really built around prototypers. So we have writers, uh, now we, we, we've scaled since, um, so we have people who've come from, um, you know, UX, uh, probably the best way to put it is like what companies they've come from. So the people come from like Apple, from IDO, from, you know, RGA from advertising agents like Wyden and Kennedy. Uh, uh, so they're storytellers, filmmakers, people from production companies, uh, uh, people from animation school, you know, uh, SVA have had an animation, you know, graduate um, with us. So it's a hodgepodge, but they all make things. They either write something or they make something. And so they're all, they're all makers. And even the, the, the leaders, um, um, the, you know, creative directors, uh, they're all what I call player coaches. They don't just sit there and you know um, think about stuff. They you know get their hands dirty making this stuff. Does that is that clear enough of a? And okay, in addition to that, so that's from the purely creative side. Then we have producers that help. Um, you know, they they've had a lot of experience either make, producing films or making big complex websites or small apps. Uh, and then we have people that herd the cats, project managers. Uh, and and they they also think strategically of of like okay that's a really cool thing how can I bridge the gap to the business problem sometimes you know and sometimes we a lot of times we you know um, retrofit what we the shiny thing we make to making sense of it and it's interesting back to your original question how do you change people's hearts and minds like um, when people feel something or are touched or they just lust after something. Like there's no rationalization, so we try to constantly try to you know make the things that just like skips all rational. Like I want that, I need that tomorrow. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.